designers! Welcome to part 5 of my Intro to Instructional Design series. Today we're going to talk about memory, motivation, and learning. Memory and motivation are where the magic happens. So let's go ahead and get started. All right, here is my overly simplified model. The disclaimer is at the top there. Here is how the human mind basically works. There's a short-term memory, and there's a long-term memory. Short-term memory is also known as working memory, primary memory, temporary memory. That's where all the stuff that you're thinking about at any current time lives. That's where the stuff, when you are learning, lives until you move it into long-term memory. So if your learners aren't learning, it's because this isn't happening. Nothing is going from short-term into long-term. If it's not in long-term memory, it's not gonna be retained. In addition to memory, you need to understand how motivation works. Learners have to be paying attention to be able to learn. It seems like a really obvious thing to say, but I cannot stress this enough, okay? To pay attention, they have to be motivated to pay attention. So two things have to happen. You have to be motivated to pay attention and you have to pay attention to be able to learn. Additionally, one last caveat here, Pairing this motivation and attention with active learning helps learners transfer new knowledge from short-term to long-term knowledge. That's really where the magic happens. They're paying attention, they're motivated to pay attention, and they're doing some sort of active learning to help transfer from short-term to long-term. Now, active learning stands in contrast to passive learning, which is what you might think of as like the traditional lecture model, where you're just kind of sitting back in a lecture hall, someone's talking at you from a stage. You're not actually doing anything. You're probably spacing out while they're talking. Things might be going into your short-term memory, but they're much less likely to make it to your long-term memory unless you're doing some sort of active learning activity. Now, adults are more likely to be self-motivated as long as they see the value. Adults are busy, they have lives, they have jobs, they have kids. They have limited time, so they really have to be motivated to even want to learn the thing that you're trying to get them to learn. So they're more likely to be self-motivated if they're invested, they're in it, but they have to see the value for them. Children, on the other hand, are more likely to be motivated by external factors. If you didn't watch my learning theories video, I recommend that because I talk about behaviorism, which is where I talk about how kids are more likely to be motivated by external rewards, whereas adults are going to be more internally motivated. So motivation, very key to making things move from short-term to long-term memory. So let's go into a little bit more detail on short-term memory. Short-term memory is basically information that you retain temporarily. Scientists have found it's no longer than about one minute. Short-term memory is where you stand up from your couch, you go into the other room to get something, you get there, and you can't remember why you're there. I don't know if it's ever happened to you, it happens to me every once in a while. It's because you're not really paying attention, you're not really focused. You put something into your short-term memory, you spaced out, maybe a minute passed, it was gone. So short-term memory holds whatever you're thinking about or aware of at any given moment. Again, it's got some other names, short-term storage, temporary memory, primary memory, working memory. Have you ever seen the movie Finding Nemo? Dory is short-term memory embodied. She is unable to move information from her short-term to her long-term memory. So she's always living in a moment, in the moment, and her memory tends to kind of reset once a minute. So she can't really remember what she's working on more than a minute or so. Now, short-term memory, of course, is really important. If we remembered all the things that we experienced and everything went to long-term memory, it would be overwhelming. And there are people that experience this and it can be really overwhelming to live that way. So short-term memory serves two tasks for us. It stores new information briefly and allows us to work on that information. So if you ever do some math in your head, trying to calculate something out, remember someone's birthday, this is where you are storing new information or information that you've retrieved and you're working on that information. Now what's really interesting about short-term memory is that there's a magic number associated with it. Memory scientists have discovered there is a magic number seven, plus or minus two, and this is the number of things the average person can hold in their short-term memory at any given time. The average person can hold seven pieces of information in their mind 
plus or minus two at any given time. So some people can hold nine pieces of information. Some people can only hold five. That's okay. It varies. And of course, this is kind of like a, a skill you could work on as well. There are people that can hold um, more information and, you know, retrieve it as they needed. So in contrast, long-term memory is where obviously things are actually live for the long haul. If something goes to long-term memory, you're going to be able to retrieve it when you want to use it. Information has to be transferred from your short term to your long term memory to stick around permanently. So as an educator or a trainer or a designer, the first step to getting your learners to retain information long term is to make it sticky and easy to process. So make it sticky uh, means make sure your learners are motivated, they're paying attention and encode it in such a way that they're able to work on it quickly in their short term memory process it and put it into their long-term memory. Now, I want to give you an example of why this is so important. I have this really fun activity for you to do. This is not my work. See the show notes for where I think this activity came from. But I want to give you an example of how short-term memory works. I'm going to give you a list of 12 letters. See how many you retain in order. Are you ready? I'm going to go to the next slide and give you about 10, 15 seconds or so to memorize the numbers. If you want to pause and wait a little bit longer to, to process that, go ahead. Okay, finished. How many did you remember? Feel free, pause, take a moment, get a pen and paper, write down how many letters you remember, see how many you got in order. Let's go ahead and check your work. Here's the string of letters again. Probably didn't do so well, I bet. So let's try something else. Try this set of 12 letters instead. Ready? I'll give you another 10 to 15 seconds to memorize these. Okay, finished. Did you better this time? Pull out that pen and paper again. See if you can write down the random string of letters and see how you did. Let's check your work. How'd you do? You did better, right? Why was it easier? Two reasons. The first is it was chunked. The letters were sorted and grouped into four separate words. Additionally, these chunks had more meaning. If you are American in particular, you'll be familiar with the YMCA or JFK. These are very familiar abbreviations that are used regularly in the English language. And we can make use of what we already know to store additional information. So they're chunked and they're organized into more memorable quote words. And it makes it much easier to remember. Once it's in your short-term memory, you're working on it, the more sticky it is, the more chunked it is, the easier it is to put into your long-term memory. Remember here, the magic number is seven plus or minus two. So I offered you up four chunks. They're meaningful, they're memorable, and you're easily able to remember those, transfer those into your long-term memory so you could test your short-term memory. So let's take a moment and notice all the things in your life that are chunked if you are American. You might recognize this as the format of a phone number. Again, if you're American, you might recognize this as a social security number. All these things have the dashes put in and they're chunked into smaller bits. That doesn't mean that they're super easy to memorize, but it does make them easier to remember than if they didn't have those dashes, if they didn't have those spaces. If you ever used a credit card, you know it's chunked into four sets of four numbers. It does make it easier to memorize, unfortunately. I can tell you I've done a fair bit of online shopping by accidentally memorizing my credit card number. So it's interesting that these things are, you know, out and about in everyday life and they take advantage of that, you know, magic number seven plus or minus two. And a lot of information is chunked to make it a little bit easier to remember. So the implications for you as a educator or a designer Break up your teaching into chunks, especially if it's something completely brand new to your learner. It needs to have meaning. Approach your learner where they are, figure out how you can give things meaning to them, assuming you've already motivated them and they're, they're paying attention. 
keep them motivated by giving meaning to what they're learning and breaking it up into chunks. If you are teaching live, like say in a Zoom webinar or a lecture, follow the 10 and two rule, no more than 10 minutes lecturing, two minutes active learning. Your learners really need time to process, they need time to, to transfer from short term to long term. If it's all go, 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 they're not getting a chance to put things into long term memory. Human brains, it's kind of like a muscle, give it a chance to rest, to process, and then you can move on to the next thing. And again, active learning helps transfer knowledge into long-term memory because they're working with the information. They're doing something with it. They're not just bringing it to their short-term memory and then kind of forgetting about it and letting it fizzle out because it's just more coming at them. Active learning gives your learners a chance to work with it and to process it, encode it, and move it into their long-term memory. Additionally, if of course active learning is really critical to long-term memory transfer, feedback is also really critical. It's important that learners are retaining correct information, remembering the right way to do something, putting that into their long-term memory and not some sort of misunderstanding. Additionally, feedback supports learner motivation. I mean, if you're just sitting in a lecture, you're not really sure if you understand something, if you have a question, you're not able to ask because maybe the lecture is too big, you know, it's not very motivating. If you're doing some sort of active learning, you're working with a mentor or a facilitator, it's really motivating to get feedback and it adds a lot of meaning to the learning experience. So these are all important things to think about as you are designing a learning experience. If you found any of this memory talk interesting, I think it's fascinating. I've got a book recommendation for you. Moonwalking with Einstein is a really neat book. 100% recommend it. Here's a synopsis. The author, Joshua, is a journalist that went to go cover the World Memory Championships. The World Memory Championships are where people compete to memorize as many decks of cards, for instance, as they can in random order. And they can repeat back multiple decks of cards in random order, in the order that they received them in the first place. It's fascinating. And what happens is Joshua is so taken by these memory athletes, basically, that he learns their secrets and returns the following year to win the World Memory Championships himself. It's really a testament to how flexible and adaptable the mind is and what humans are really capable of. So highly recommend. I'll put the link in the show notes for you. And that's mostly it for our intro to instructional design series. If you missed any videos, I go, I encourage you to go back and watch them. Again, the whole series is just a basic introduction to instructional design. I've got lots more videos if you want to go deeper into instructional design. And you can also comment in the comments as well if you have some ideas and what I can um, focus on going forward. Be sure to like and subscribe so you can see the rest of the content I have for you. And next up, part six of six will be my takeaways video. It'll be a recap and wrap up of all the important things that you should transfer into your own long-term memory from my intro to instructional design series. Thanks for watching.